Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Canadian-born, New Orleans-based trumpeter and singer Jonathan Bauer. On his new 2021 CD, Sings and Plays, Andy also talks about this COVID world we are all navigating. This new album is his second release as a leader and his first as a singer. The construction of the album began just before the onset of COVID, and it's a great story. Enjoy. Thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. Oh, man, I'm so glad to be here, you know, in my, in, uh, my in-law's basement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I guess that's probably a part of what we're going to talk about. You know, your album Sings and Plays comes out during a pandemic. I'm not quite sure where Canada is right now, but I just want to know from you, what do you how do you feel about the timing of this? Yeah, so it was it was absolutely a lot cuz uh I, I think as I'm, I I think you're where I are. I still I live in New Orleans and Louisiana has uh you know, Louisiana has just really been through it. It's not been easy. Every chance that we've had to insist that things not be easy, Louisiana has taken those chances. Uh, my parents are up in are, were are up in Canada. They're actually able to visit with me right now, which is is really really nice. But uh, they're living up in uh, in Alberta, and Alberta's doing. Not necessarily always as good as the rest of Canada. I can't. I can't speak to it too much, but things are definitely different up there, and they have they have different traumas kind of around. We started recording this album in, um, you know, and we had these different iterations too. We had this. Um, we had this regular trio hit on Sundays. With this, with this, the whole band on Saturdays. We had this regular, you know, this regular gig often on Fridays, and just playing all the time. So I, I called up all my musicians and I was like, "Hey, what I'd like to start doing is uh, getting is like just booking kind of a half day or a day in the studio, maybe once every month, just because I want us to to start where we're gigging so much. I kind of want to start having uh, some more practice time in the studio." And, uh, you know, if we get a track here or there, we get a track here or there. Everything I knew everything was going to sound great. But then it, it took the pressure off of having to, like, show up in one day and record a whole record. So I, I had all my musicians come in with me in, in January uh, for our first of those sessions. Yeah, so we had the, the session in January. And then I went to visit, my partner and I went to visit her parents. They were living in Nigeria at the time, and I was sitting in a hotel in Lagos, and we looked up at the TV, and it was like, uh, coronavirus, what, what, is, what is that? I had no comprehension that this had existed before that moment, and we were feeling a little concerned, actually. We were like, oh, geez, are we going to be able to get back? Through, through Europe and to the United States. That worked out all right, and we got home just before, just before things kind of hit, and the, the, the pandemic completely, my sort of, my sort of drive and desire to, to move the project forward, you know, it totally, it got shelved for uh, months until I kind of like got the, got the spark to get the musicians back together when it were in a, in a way that was safe to do so, so we, rented out another half day in a studio that had uh, isolation booths for all the instruments. And it's not always necessarily my favorite way to record, but in the pandemic, it made it so that we could all feel good about doing it. Then, you know, it almost got shelved again because it's just like the waves of dealing with the pandemic, they just take such a toll that then it took me a while to get around to finding the energy to mix it. And then once it was mixed, it took me a while to find the energy to get around to mastering it. But when, when I would come back to it, it was, it really kept me sane. You know, it really kept me, it, it really kind of re-motivated me each time. I was like, right, here is something that I, I have access to and I can be in control of. And I can I can still do something with my time and my artistic energy. Right on. So talk to me a little bit about what you ultimately want the listener to get from this. I mean, it's obviously a lot of emotion, a lot of energy, a lot of things going on, especially with the way the world is now. But what do you ultimately hope they get from this? Man, when I when I started this, 
it, like I said, it was totally just like I had this super swinging band and I was like, man, things are, things are feeling hot right now. And I really want to introduce myself to the world as a, as a singer, as well as a trumpet player. Like that's something that's been important to me in this music and in the lineage of trumpet players uh, and musicians in general that I have listened to, you know, more so than anything, man, it's, it's just that like, it's going to keep moving. It's going to keep happening. Music is going to continue to be made. Art is going to be continue to be made. We are going to continue to swing out. We are going to bring this to you. And I really hope for a lot of younger musicians that albums like mine and other albums that are coming out right now, I think are, are just beyond important because I really want them to see that, like, we're still out here doing this. You know, like, I don't, I don't think I would have lasted in a non-pandemic existence as, a, as like, convincing myself that I'm allowed to be a musician if, if it weren't for my living and regional and national uh, inspirations. So, you know, I really just want to keep reminding people that we can do this. So talk to me about how you got the jazz bug. How did all this begin for you? I was in high school, and I actually uh, wanted to become an Olympic swimmer. It was like a big goal of mine, and I didn't want to be in band at all. And <laughs> But my mom signed me up for band in the ninth grade. I'd done it for a couple of years before that, but I wanted to quit. So she signed me up for band in the ninth grade. And she said, well, I've already signed you up for it, so you're doing it. And then the band teacher said, well, we also have jazz band. And I was like, what's, what's jazz band? I had, I had no clue. So that was really how it kind of got started for me, was like playing in my high school big band. And I was, I was like, this is just so much cooler. And then uh, a friend of mine was kind of like, well, he went to another high school. But uh, we were both in the in the community college big band when we were in high school. He was also a trumpet player. And he was like, well, man, you should check this out. And he uh, lent me a copy of Chet Baker Sings that to this day I might, I might have. I might owe Darren a copy of Chet Baker Sings because I'm pretty sure I still have that exact copy. But uh, And I, I just remember putting it on. I was like, what? what is this? You know, like, I don't want to sound like a cliche, but I was like, I didn't know we could do that. I didn't know that was an option. And then, you know, that just took me down this rabbit hole of like, uh, well, like, who is this Chet Baker? And like, well, I didn't know there were trumpet players like this. So what is this? How, what, how many other jazz trumpet players are there? And I started, you know, Googling it because I, I, by that point, the Internet was used that way. So and I was, then I, you know found all these other inspirations and <laughs> and some of it some of it was resonated with me immediately and then some of it I really didn't understand and it kind of like it kind of freaked me out and some of those records that used to kind of freak me out have since become some of my favorite records so it's, it's funny how you know that that process kind of works right on well what was the first live jazz show you ever saw oh man um I'm from a small city in the northernmost tip of Alberta called Fort McMurray, about five hours north of Edmonton, Alberta. And there was a saxophone player who took the community college, you know, music gig there. His name was Bill Prout. His name is Bill Proughton. And once a year, he would get the funding to fly in musicians from Vancouver, Toronto, wherever, and they would do like a three, like a two, three day uh, workshop and festival thing. So like my real first live jazz experiences were very regional to the existence of like Canadian jazz. They were uh, Jody Prosnick on bass and Tilden Webb on piano and Ted Warren on drums. And yeah, it was very, it was very regional and uh, very cool that way because like I didn't, I didn't know at the time how important having these examples of people who are like actively doing it today who were not like, you know, the jazz leaden stars, you know, I didn't, I didn't know at the time how important their influence would be on me. So now that you are a professional musician, what's the greatest thing about this? What, I mean, every day you get to wake up and create 
what do you like the best about being a musician? What I like the most about being a musician about being a musician is that as you grow as a human being and as a person, you also grow as a musician because it's it's always changing based on kind of where you are in your development. You know, there have been periods of time where I've been mostly a sideman. There have been periods of time where I've been mostly a leader. I started putting out records now, so, like, that's taken up a lot of my time. But, like, there have been periods of time where I cared more about whether or not other musicians were going to dig it. And then I, you know, kept growing as a person and became more sound in just, like, what do I love and what do I care about? And then all those other things started to fall away. So it's, it's really cool to me that it's like, if you look, I can look at a lot of my career and my personal growth side by side, and I can see a lot of the correlations of when I kind of started dealing with these like self-worth issues or these other problems, not really problems, but these other aspects of my life, I started to notice myself becoming uh, an even more complete musician, you know, just aside from my practice on the horn. So I think, yeah, I think that's the coolest part about being a musician for me is that, like, it really, you really do, it really does grow with you. So now that we're kind of, things are opening up somewhat and we're going to get back to it, what do you hope we all realize about this long absence away from live music? My biggest takeaway, man, is uh, something that's been really important to me during this like pandemic time is like to realize not only does not everybody want exactly what you want but it's likely that most people don't want exactly what you want and that's just not like not even just as human beings in general but like specifically as musicians it's likely that most people don't want what you want so i hope like re i really want to strive for is that we spend more and more time recognizing that every last human being's relationship with music and with being a musician is valid and is important and is unique. And, you know, and my other big thing is that, like, if you are making a living as a musician, if you're out there, if you're out there and you got a gig, I don't care who you are, you deserve a living wage. You know, like, I really want to see musicians just being respected for who they are and I want to see musicians being treated especially financially like the way that they deserve to be treated it's just it's just been too too difficult and too eye-opening these past couple years for things to go back to the ways that they exactly were before tell me this everyone has a perception of you your family your friends your fans but ultimately you live your life who do you think you are yeah that's, that's a good one, man. Yeah, I like. I wasn't expecting a question like that. Um, I'm Jonathan Bauer, which is you know, it's a million. It's a, I'm a million different things. You know, I'm not just a musician. I'm not just a. I'm not just a trumpet player. I'm not just a singer. I like to think that you know, I'm a great partner to my fiance, and I like to think that I'm a good son to my parents and to my in-laws and I like to think that I'm a good friend to those who are around me and I like to think that when given the when given the opportunity to share myself or given the opportunity to share anything that I might have learned I like to think that I'm I'm gracious with that so I know there are parts of me inside me that would like to tell me that I'm a bad person and that I am not deserving of the life that I'm living. But I like to also, you know, acknowledge those parts of me, thank them for trying to protect me in their own weird way, and then go back to just moving forward and enjoying my, enjoying my life from all aspects of it and not just that of whether or not I am a good trumpet player and singer. Right on, Jonathan. Hey, thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today. I really appreciate it, man. Oh, no problem, man.
I really appreciate you uh, reaching out and giving me the you know the platform to talk about this. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We'll give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in Canada, New Orleans, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Jonathan for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.